So what's going on Dammers, my name is Mehul and welcome to your second part of learning JavaScript Unlocked series in which we're going to take a look at a lot of things in JavaScript in one compact crunched video. So if you haven't watched part one and you wish to begin with JavaScript, I highly recommend you to watch that because this part is in continuation of part one where we left. So without wasting any time, let's get into it. Okay, so last time we left at doing loops and all that stuff and basically let's just continue with the type of operator actually i would have done that in the last video itself but there were some glitches with the audio and the video so um i was not able to do it so let's just continue with type of and we're gonna proceed from there onwards so what we know is that for example if i create let my string is hello now let's just say i want to do something like if i want to just do some sort of operation only if i know that my string is actually a string then only if i want to proceed then i need to use something like type of now type of is an operator which would return you the type of a particular variable you want to wish to know so if i do type of my string is string so let's just quickly create a function which just says add nums a comma b right and i'm just gonna do um if type of a is equal to number and type of b is equal to number then only i want to add those numbers right return a plus b otherwise and actually you can just get rid of the semicolon otherwise what i want to do is just return um invalid numbers right and what i can do is just add nums minus one and one let's just see we get zero i can do add nums of a and b we see you see that we get invalid numbers because obviously um type of a here is string and b here is string as well coming to math.random now let's just say you are creating some sort of game which requires some sort of randomness in your application logic so for that what we have is math math oops math.random and what this does this function is basically this returns you a value between zero and one so it's zero inclusive and one exclusive so um for example let's just say we create an array of numbers um this is let's just say five ten fifteen just like that and let's just say i want to pick up a random number from this array so we can make use of math.random here I can say I want to select an index. Now this index should be random, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that this index, um, or actually not, let's not just create this using let because we would not be able to change it later on. So I'm just gonna put it right here only. So I'm gonna say mad.random, right? But there's a problem. This is a fraction. There are a couple of problems we get a number between 0 and 1 which is obviously what we don't want and we get a number which is fraction so how do we fix the first problem well i can scale a number from 0 to 1 to 0 to n by just multiplying it with n right if you think about it you have a number which is 0 to 1 and you want to scale it to 0 to n you have to just multiply it by n so i multiply it by the length of the array there we go now we have a second problem as well that is these numbers will be fractional so we need to just flow them down or rather make them in teachers with math.floor function and since math.random could not be one anyhow so we would never get n which is the length of array so we would never run out of the index for example the length of this array is one two three four five six right so this would be six times something six times something which is very small than one but not one so we would get something like 5.99999 right and when we flow this down i'm telling you about the maximum um number we can get it when we flow this down we get five which is zero one two three four five that is correct because we do not want to access the sixth element because there's no sixth element so if you go ahead and hit, hit enter on this you see we get 15 if you go ahead and do it again we are getting random numbers every time which is cool okay with that being done let's just come to something known as set timeout 
in JavaScript. So a lot of times you want to have some sort of actions running again and again, just like we do in a loop, but basically doing it in a specific interval. For example, you want to run a countdown or you want to maybe animate some stuff, but that's another thing because for animation, we have something better than set timeout. But anyways, set timeout, using set timeout, we can basically do um, interval kind of stuff. So you see I pass in a function here. I created this function here only. You can create it separately. Now, whatever I pass in this would be repeatedly run um, every X milliseconds I supply here. So for example, if I say every one second, which is a thousand milliseconds, I want to just console.log hey boy and hit enter you see we get hey boy um not really every one second but just after one second because set timeout what it does is runs a particular piece of block of code after the specified interval not every specified interval i'm sorry about that that is something known as set intervals job so when you do set interval of this we get this console log statement running every second. However, set timeout does its jobs only one time and then exits. Now, you might be wondering what these strange IDs here are, these numbers which are returned. So these numbers are basically the IDs assigned to these intervals and all that stuff. So for example, if I want to just stop this interval, I'm done with it. So what I would do is just write clear interval and paste the ID returned by this interval. So you see that our counter now stops. Similarly, if I want to just cancel a set timeout before it has fired, then I can just clear, um, clear, use clear timeout instead of clear interval and then pass this ID. But anyways, it has completed, so it's no use now. And obviously in real programming, you would just do something like let X store this. And then if there's some condition met in here, then inside this only you would say clear interval of X. And you can see that it kind of behaves like um, a set timeout because you just run it once and then you just quit the timeout. Okay, now let's just discuss about hoisting in JavaScript. So um, if you're coming from a background like C or C++, it might seem a bit weird for you to do something like let result is my nums and then a and let's just say five and two and then later on you're defining my nums here as uh, a, B, which basically just returns A times B. So you see that result is still 10. Now this might be a little bit weird if you're coming from C or C++ because there you need to define these things both or basically before you use them. And since JavaScript is a, is a you know, language which originated kind of from C only, it might be a little bit weird for you guys to actually see. But what happens here is behind the scenes, what um, JavaScript engine does is known as something known as hoisting, hoisting, right? So what these guys do is basically they would copy all the functions and place them at the top. So functions and declarations always pasted on the top. So this result is basically transformed into something like let result and then result is equal to my nums. And I believe that um, let calls are not hoisted. So you basically get something like this only. But if you use something like var x is five, then what this is interpreted as var x and then x is equal to five, then here goes your all other code, right? All other code goes kind of here. And then basically declaration is always at the first plus the functions and hoisting is, uh, and you know, initialization is at later on stage. So this hoisting is a reason why you are able to access functions and variables before they are actually available. And let's just look at an interesting example here. So what we can do is basically say return five. Return, let's just say, um, okay, just to say return type of x, right? And what I'm going to do is write a function x here and say something like nothing, basically. So what should happen technically is if you are coming from 
any language background, you should be knowing that when you return from a function, nothing below it should run, right? But again, hosting is not done at the runtime. It's done at the, um, not really at the compile time because JavaScript is not compiled. It's just run before the JavaScript actually runs. So what happens is that the compiler would place this function at the top in its own scope. Obviously, it would just not tear up all the function and place it at the very top. Obviously, it would take it at the top, place it right here just before this return. And then we have X defined and we would be happy then. So if I run like my nums, hit enter, you see we get function as return type. However, if I do something like if I remove this at all and then run my nums, you see um, that we get X because X is already kind of a defined variable right here. So let's just get, get rid of something like this and do like now. You see, we get undefined now because this variable is not defined. However, if we just do it one more time for the sake of functions. So we can just create this thing, this boy right here. You see, now if I call my nums, we again get function because of hosting. All right, now let's come to variable scoping. And this is a bit of a kind of new thing with let and const keywords, which was not the thing with the var keyword. So with var keyword, variables were scoped inside your blocks. So for example, um, let's just say you have a loop. Let's just say x in a, is an array like that. And uh, I do something like for var i equal to zero, i is less than x dot length, i plus plus. Console dot log x of i like that. You see we get all the elements nicely but if i hit i and hit enter you see that i is still defined here which is kind of a feature which might be useful in some cases but not really in all for example if i just um i'm not sure it's it's useful if you if you know that it's working right like this because um you might use i unknowingly thinking that its scope is over but instead it would return you a particular value which was not what you expected so to fix this thing what we have is let so for example when you initialize a variable inside let it's it's kind of bound within the scope of whatever it is running in so for example if i do like at index of zero index is less than x dot length index plus plus and do the similar thing console.log x of index hit enter you see that we still get the same thing but now i'm not able to write index and access because it is scoped only for this particular block it loses its scope right here similarly with functions as well we can create um not with functions obviously we can create global variables so this is my global var 5 i can access it in a function just like saying console.log global war, right? Uh, let me just change this name as x2. And I can run x2 here. You see that we get this global war logged in. And basically, inside functions, if you write a similar variable, so for example, if I do let global war is 6, what you would see is that. I get six instead of five because um, every function has its own scope, right? So when you define a variable inside its inside its function, then the chain starts from something like this. So it will look inside its function. If the variable is not found, then it will look inside its parent. Then if the variable is not found in the parent as well, it will look inside its parent and so on and so forth. This is basically a kind of model with on which JavaScript inherently works on, which is called prototypal inheritance model, which we're going to talk about later on. So for now, let's just remember that every function has every object, every block has its own scope. So just make sure you don't mess up your scopes. Otherwise, you will be in trouble. OK, so now let's just come to this keyword. And by this, I literally mean this keyword. So this keyword in JavaScript is basically maintained by the JavaScript 
engine when it runs your JavaScript code and points to a very specific thing, which is in which context the particular code is running. So for example, if I write this, so this code ran in global context. So that is why I get window. Now, what, what you have to basically remember is that the context of this usually changes when you go inside objects. And by that, what I mean, let me just refresh the page real quick here. And what we can do here is I can say, let my object is um, consists of, a, let's just say a function, which is my method is a function here, which is basically console.logging this. Oops. This right here, right? So now if I do my object dot my method right here, you see that I get my method as the value of this. However, if I do this right here, I get window. Now the reason for this is when you run a method inside a function, which is inside an object, then the value of this changes. This does not change when you run a function directly like x, y, z, I get console.log this. And if I run x, y, z, I still get window. However, let me just surprise you a little bit if you did not know this before. If I do something like let my function is my object dot my method, now my function is basically the definition of the function. Just guess what would happen if I run my function now. Would the value of this be window or my method or basically something you have never seen before? So if I run my function right here, you see that we get window. Now the reason for that is once I run this line, my function is pointing to that particular function. It's no longer going through that object to call that function. Just make it clear in your mind that when you are calling something through an object, then that object takes the this value, right? Now, to, to actually overcome, um, for example, if you just want to have this pointing to global only, what you can do is make use of arrow functions right here. So if I just clear this thing a little bit and say let my object do, and if, if I make use of arrow functions instead of our function keyword, hit enter. And if I do my object two dot my method right here, you see I get window as the basically the value of this. Now this is because these arrow functions are implemented in such a way that they always point there. This always point to the parent which is calling them right not the global not always the global only the parent which is calling them so this is was a little bit information on this okay so let's just now talk a little about what dom is which is a document object model which is basically the thing you see right here so right now you see that there's not pretty much a lot of things going on inside the dom but uh, what you should basically know as a kind of a thing for um, JavaScript developer that this DOM is constructed by the browser but it is accessible fully through JavaScript and a lot of other languages have other libraries which can access DOM it's not just specific to JavaScript, JavaScript only you can access DOM in various other languages so JavaScript is just a language to access and manipulate DOM for example if I go to like site like google.com here we should be able to see that its DOM consists of elements like this div, this div, you see all these kinds of elements, this logo and all that stuff. So for example, if I want to get um, reference to the DOM, what I can do is basically make use of document keyword here. So the document is the root of the DOM. So if I do document dot and go down a little you'll see all the properties i have for these so if i do something like get um or oh, let me just do query selector and img which is the image you see i get the first image which is found on the web page and apparently this is the google images logo itself and if i do query selector all of img you see that there are a total of four images right here which we can see and all the properties associated with them as well. 
So basically you can make use of everything we have learned so far while querying for these images and working on them and basically working with the DOM. So docu there are tons of methods on uh, manipulating DOM and you can basically just Google them and find what's necessary for your use and learn according to them and practice them later on. But basically the crux of the thing is that if you want to modify and tamper with the DOM, you just have to make use of document object and basically it will just give you access to everything. So document.cookie is basically gives you access to the cookies of a particular user. And obviously I'm just gonna log out my account right now because I just made my account cookies public, which is kind of a weird thing to do so that you're not able to access my cookies. Hopefully, Gmail does not have a vulnerability where you can just copy and paste cookies and you get access to account. But anyways, so uh, what we have right now is basically this document and just manipulate around it a little bit. We also have something known as a window, which is sometimes what we people call as browser object model. And if you pay close attention, this is what this pointed just a few moments ago do and if you do something like this is window which is uh, which is not really a right thing to do in case of objects but okay so um, this is actually window only right now so um, window consists of all the methods which you want to access like alert hello there you see we get hello there as the pop-up then we have window.confirm do you wish wish to do this action and you see that it gives me two option okay and cancel if i do okay it returns me true if i if i had done cancel it would return me false and then we can do something like window.prompt as well where i get just an input and if i hit okay i get that input back to javascript so there are tons and tons of other methods with window as well which just allow you to play a little around but not really specific to JavaScript. These are just implementations of the browser. Mind you that JavaScript is not limited to browsers only. So document and window objects are not available in environments like Node.js. So these are just browser specific things. I just wanted to touch them a little bit. Okay, so basically that's it for this part. And what I want to do is just create two more videos, which would be the one would be on covering the aspects of JavaScript in browser and the second one would basically be covering the secrets of JavaScript kind of things which people usually overlook and do not really know or basically the things which are actually interesting but are not really read by most of the developers which would be probably titled you don't know JavaScript. So that's all for this video and I'll see you then in the next one. And one more thing, if you like this video, then don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to receive instant notifications.